Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will, in the space of 15 short minutes, uh, try and convince you that there are ways in which uh, the poor can actually resolve the complex set of equations that they are confronted with when they look at energy, the available forms of energy they have, and paths out of poverty. Uh, our organization has done a considerable amount of work in the villages of India, central India, and we are now sharing that expertise uh, on a slightly wider platform across not just India, but several other countries of the region. We underestimate the challenge, and uh, this, I think, uh, is the starting point in terms of uh, making sure that we get to where we want to. Uh, that figure of 409 million people without electricity in their households is of 2011. And can any of you guess what that figure might have been like in 2001, 10 years ago? it was 419 million. Right? In a country as big and strong as India would want to be, we've just made a very, very small dent, you know, or touched a very small part of the problem in terms of getting electricity to people's households. And this hasn't been for want of investment. In fact, the government of India has, for the last six years, probably been running the biggest grid extension program that you can think of and looked at officially out of the 650,000 villages that there are in India, there are just on record 18,000 that are not grid connected. But does that mean there's electricity flowing through the wires? You probably guessed it right, no. And you still have about 60 million households, that number of people, who just don't get any electricity, and in households where there is electricity flowing through the wires, it's only for four hours or six hours, or even in good states, maybe 10 or 12 hours a day. So that's the magnitude of the problem. Where's the connect to poverty? Because it, just isn't, it isn't just about lighting up people's homes. In fact, if you go to villages and ask people what they need electricity for, lighting actually comes third. And it's the other two points there that people rate as being much more important. One, we need electricity to add value to whatever we are producing locally, because that's what gets us money. That's what will help us change our lives. And two, farmers are in desperate need of clean energy, particularly electricity. Uh, there are, across the seven states, from north to eastern India, about 39 million diesel pump sets being used to pump water out from the ground into the fields. That's the extent to which people have had to rely on fossil fuels in villages. Irrigation is a big, big need, and it costs people, farmers, a lot of money. And then, of course, you have the lighting and cooking solutions that are so desperately required that can change people's lives. What's the response? If you look at it from a macro point of view, there can be only one way of solving this, which is to go decentralized. And I'm not saying this just because, uh, you know, it's been tried out, uh, large power plants, grids, grids going across to villages, etc. I'm saying this because decentralization has a very strong rationale. It's been helped along in the last decade or so. Uh, you have technologies that are increasingly reliable, they're affordable, they're more accessible, and I think what's very important is that you have a service capability that makes sure these technologies can work in villages. So there's been change on that front, which helps decentralization. The second point is, uh, is uh, you, you cannot sort of deny it, which is that the unmet demand in rural areas of the country is so huge that there's just no way we'd be able to meet it from fossil fuels. If you wanted to, with all our coal-fired power plants, etc., being set up, imports, whatever have you, there's just no way you could meet that extent of unmet demand. And so it makes a huge amount of sense to go not just renewables, but to actually empower communities to produce the kind of electricity that they need from their own resources. It's also true now that if you have to invest in infrastructure, it's much better to invest in decentralized infrastructure because the cost of getting 
grid-based electricity out to villages is actually much higher now for new infrastructure than you need to put in if you were talking about decentralized power. I'm focusing on electricity here because one, it is the biggest problem, two, it's a political issue, and three, it has an amazing effect in terms of being able to change people's lives. And then, of course, you can customize business models and you have enhanced policy support for renewables. The government is kicking in with large programs. And what have we done? We've tried to, in our organization, work across the entire chain, from innovation to incubation of the models to instituting the kind of support service mechanisms that I was talking about, and also getting to influence people in terms of what needs to be done in terms of change. Let me talk to you now about sharing possibilities, which is the theme of Technoport, and I'll share three or four examples of what has worked. It's worked on a small scale, and then later on in the presentation, we'll get to how we could possibly scale these up in terms of much larger numbers. The Baharbari Audyogik Vikas Sehkari Samiti is a cooperative. It's been set up by the Panchayat of the village. They decided they want energy independence and started using biomass to produce electricity. What's innovative about this cooperative is not just the fact that they're producing electricity in a remote corner of Bihar, one of the poorest states of India, but the fact that they've been extremely innovative in terms of the business model. The cooperative does not, for example, sell electricity to farmers, it sells water. And why would you want to do that? One, because water is the product that farmers need, and two, what happens is that farmers do not, your customer does not equate the price of electricity that you are charging to the price of electricity that's coming in from the grid because you have a different product being offered. And in turn, what that does is it makes this operation profitable because if any of these decentralized power plants were to charge for electricity at the rate that the grid does, one, they'd probably never get set up because the business plans would just not be viable. And two, even if they did get money from somewhere and set them up, they'd close down pretty fast. They wouldn't even be able to meet operating costs. So there's a lot of innovation there around offering products which are different, services which are different, which get you away from that comparison with the grid, which is incidentally a political minefield in India. Uh, there are states that actually give electricity free to farmers and at hugely subsidized rates to the poor. So an example there of what innovation can do. You've got community power plants. This particular plant set up in a village called Rampura in uh, central India was set up with a Norwegian company called Skatex Solar. Uh, on the 4th of February 2010, the Norwegian prime minister visited this plant. And the leader of this project from the village stood up to make a speech. It was a one-line speech. It was dramatic. All he said was, our village has not had a power cut for the last two years. Right? And that's something, quite honestly, who even I or any of you know, my friends or family or people, even the rich, cannot claim. I live outside Delhi in a swanky suburb called Gurgaon. We have eight-hour power cuts in summer. And this person stood up and said, we haven't had a power cut for two years. Right. So it's as simple as that. And there was a lot of not just pride behind that, but there was a lot of empowerment, the feeling of you know, something having changed. And we've worked with this community for about a decade, and I can tell you that the transition from a community that was struggling, that was grappling with its development needs, to a community that has suddenly become constructive much more positive, is opening new ground, has been possible because of electricity coming into their lives. The Gaushala model. If you're wondering what a Gaushala is, it's a cow shelter. We've got a long tradition in India of taking care of cows, particularly when they grow old. Uh, voluntary agencies, you know, local groups, etc., they take care of them in shelters. And this has, for 700 years or maybe even more, been a charitable institution. A couple of us looked at cow dung, not as a waste, but as a valuable resource. Cow shelters have a lot of cow dung. 
And to cut a long story short, what we did was we turned the whole thing around from being a charitable place to actually being a place where electricity gets produced. You run small enterprises, three or four of them, as a result of that power, and you get your own revenue, which in turn helps you to run the cow shelter in a much better manner. And this is now being replicated in several locations. Jobs, the connect between energy and poverty. We've set up about a dozen rural entrepreneurship zones. And the idea is very simple. Produce clean power, connect it to a range of services, and people, they become secure, safe, productive workplaces where people can come and use clean energy. Uh, the example that you see there is from a rural entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship zone that focuses on producing building material, affordable building material that people can use to build their houses. But these examples and the numbers that I've been giving, uh, 20, 12, 6, etc., are pilots. And one must ask, we certainly do, and I'm sure everyone in this audience would, and the international community certainly asks questions of scale. Right? How do you mainstream this in the market? Right? The point you need to remember is that markets exist, and the power of enterprise can take such service delivery to scale. Let's look at the telecom example in India. 50 years, 4.7 million connections. The next eight or nine, what happened? We jumped to 54. Telecom, privatization. And then in the last four to five years, we have 450 million. And this, is, this isn't the number of connections. These are the numbers of distinct users that you have. So there was obviously something happening. But, and this is a big but when we come to the energy question, that that power of enterprise actually also meant that the telecom industry has become the second largest consumer of subsidized diesel in India. Again, a big issue. Where do they get the clean technology from? We've been working with a host of partners on a program called SPEED, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, where you combine the energy needs of the village over here with telecom towers as the anchor load. And we have viable business models in which, because of the anchor load and because of a stronger service orientation, you can set up village power plants using renewables. The speed concept relies on the central box here being run as a business and the program providing a range of supports. Uh, we will, by next summer, have about 30 such projects. Currently, there are three that are already working. If we talk about scale, I just thought I'd throw out some ideas in terms of what the strategic imperatives are um, if we are to ramp up the numbers, actually start going global. In technology, there is still work left on technology, particularly hybrids. How do you, in a village context, combine wind with solar or solar with biomass? Capital cost reduction. Solar energy, the costs have been coming down. In the others, they haven't. And solar can't be a solution for everything particularly productive loads. If you need to run pumps and motors, solar energy isn't your best choice. Skill development, supply chain management. Uh, the picture that you see there is actually an energy plantation. Uh, at one of our power plants, they decided they just want to secure their biomass supply and got into growing an energy crop. In terms of finance, how do you combine the big with the small? You need local operators. Local operators aren't investable. So can you combine them with big companies like we're doing in the speed project so that money can come to those companies that have attractive balance sheets and then they set up a kind of franchising model to run these small projects? Of course, leveraging all the government support subsidies that you can and opening lines of credit for microenterprise. Institutional partnerships with the public sector, with community-based organizations and involvement of the private sector. If you look at policy, there are issues around off-grid projects, standalone renewable energy-based projects that aren't getting resolved fast enough. I think that's the issue. There's a lot of agreement around what needs to be done, but there isn't that much action in terms of going ahead and doing it fast. And let me end with a thought. Think of this whole area of renewable energy, village power plants, its connect to poverty as an iceberg. If you run the numbers and conservative numbers, you have revenues possible of anywhere between one to three billion US dollars every year from just those 60 million households. 
The range exists because it depends on whether you compare it to grid power or you compare it to diesel replacement, which is much more expensive. So my question is, who wants to be the McDonald's of renewable energy in India? Because you'll need people who can come in with a 20-year vision, $5 billion, and they can make this work. Are there companies out there in Norway that would like to do that? We can certainly help. Thank you. <laughs>